Hi, my name is Michael Honick fort and I'll be giving an overview of trans fats and partially hydrogenated oils, specifically the regulatory issues surrounding ingredients containing trans fat, health issues, and FDA's current activities. So what is trans fat? Trans refers to the arrangement of hydrogen atoms on the double bonds in a fatty acid chain. When we refer to trans fats, we are talking about unsaturated fatty acids that contain trans double bonds. There are two main sources of trans fat in foods. Naturally occurring trans fat in ruminant animal products, such as meat and dairy products, and industrially produced, or artificial, formed during the hydrogenation of vegetable oils or other oils to make them more solid or semi-solid fats. The primary dietary source of artificial or industrially produced trans fat is partially hydrogenated oils, or PHOs. The trans arrangement in these oils results in a relatively straight configuration of the fatty acids, making them more like saturated fat, and they increase the melting point, shelf life, and flavor stability of the oil. Because these technical properties, PHOs have been used by the food industry in such products as margarine, shortening, and baked goods. The trans fatty acid content of PHOs can vary from approximately 10 to 60 percent of the oil, depending on how the oil is manufactured, and they have an average trans fatty acid content of 25 to 45 percent of the oil. I note that there is no formal regulatory definition for PHOs. Trans fat is also formed unintentionally during the production of non-hydrogenated refined vegetable oils as a result of the high temperatures used during processing steps such as deodorization. The concentration of trans fatty acids in non-hydrogenated refined oils is typically below 2%. Low levels may also be found in fully hydrogenated oils due to incomplete hydrogenation. As I mentioned previously, some trans fat occurs naturally in the products from ruminant animals such as milk or beef. The science on the safety of trans fat has evolved over time, and studies show that there is a direct correlation between consumption of trans fat and LDL cholesterol, or bad cholesterol. This causes increased risk of coronary heart disease. Trans fat has also been shown to lower HDL, or good, cholesterol. Trans fat has also been connected to a number of other adverse health effects. For instance, some studies suggest that trans fat consumption worsens insulin resistance, especially in those predisposed to the condition. Trans fat may increase diabetes risk, but this association requires further study. There have also been reports in the literature with evidence that breastfeeding infants of mothers who regularly consume high levels of trans fat may be at risk for impaired growth. The scientific evidence demonstrating that consumption of trans fats increases LDL is the basis for the 2005 recommendation from the Institute of Medicine, or IOM, to limit trans fat consumption as much as possible. In particular, IOM recognized the positive linear trend between trans fat intake, LDL concentration, and heart disease, and concluded that trans fatty acids are not essential and provide no known benefit to human health and recommended that trans fatty acid consumption be kept as low as possible while consuming a nutritionally adequate diet. Other authoritative reports that recommend limiting intake of trans fat to reduce coronary heart disease include the Dietary Guidelines for Americans and reports from the American Heart Association. In their 2013 guidelines on lifestyle to reduce cardiovascular risk, the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology strongly recommended that clinicians advise adults who would benefit from LDL reduction to reduce percentage of calories from trans fat. Now, partially hydrogenated oils have had a long history of use in food. The hydrogenation process has been used commercially since the 1940s. The commonly used partially hydrogenated oils, such as soybean and cottonseed oils, are considered generally recognized as safe, or grass, by the food industry. FDA has not affirmed these oils as grass. However, there are two partially hydrogenated oils that have been affirmed as grass by FDA. These are partially hydrogenated canola oil and partially hydrogenated menhaden oil, neither of which is extensively used by the food industry. 
The citations for these oils in FDA's regulation, regulations in the Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR, appear on this slide. Now I'd like for you to take the poll and answer whether you read food labels and try to avoid products that contain PHOs. Okay, well great, it looks like a majority of you do read food labels and try to avoid these products. About 80%. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears for a minute and I'm going to talk briefly about how food ingredients are regulated. In Section 201S, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act defines a food additive as any substance the intended use of which results or is reasonably expected to result directly or indirectly in its becoming a component or otherwise affecting the characteristics of any food. The FDNC Act mandated pre-market review of food additives. These requirements are detailed in FDA's regulations in the Code of Federal Regulations or the CFR. Generally, FDA reviews data submitted by a petitioner and makes a safety determination. Please pardon your question. Your conference contains less than three percent of this class. If you would like to continue, press star one now. So the conference will be terminated. Stand by one second. Sorry about that. These requirements are detailed in the FDA's regulations in the Code of Federal Regulations or the CFR. Generally, FDA re reviews data submitted by a petitioner and makes a safety determination which results in a food additive regulation. So in addition to defining what a food additive is, the Act also carves out a number of substances that are exempted from the definition, including grass substances. This is important as these exempted substances do not require pre-market approval and review by FDA via a food additive petition. As Dr. West Barnett discussed in the previous talk, grass substances must either be generally recognized by experts to be safe or be based on common use in food prior to 1958. However, safety determinations are based on the best available information at the time, and if new evidence becomes available, the grass status of the substance can change. History of use is not sufficient to support continued grass status if new evidence demonstrates that there is no longer consensus about the safety of an ingredient. This slide shows a comparison of grass substances and food additives. You've seen some of this information in the previous talk. As Shayla mentioned, the safety standard for food additives and grass substances is the same, though a food additive approval is FDA's decision, whereas a grass determination is safety by general consensus among experts. FDA's safety standard comes from the legislative history and is described in 21 CFR Part 170.3i. The standard is reasonable certainty of no harm under the intended conditions of use. Now with that background, I'm going to switch back to discussion of FDA's actions to address trans fat consumption. Our activities go back to 1999 when we proposed that trans fat content be provided in nutrition labeling to help consumers determine how each food product contributes to their overall dietary intake of trans fat. Our proposal was supported by findings from studies that evaluated evidence that dietary trans fatty acids influence blood lipid and cholesterol levels in humans and increase their risk of coronary heart disease. In 2003, we issued a final rule, which I've linked to from this slide, amending our nutrition labeling regulations to require a declaration of trans fat in the nutrition label of conventional foods and dietary supplements. This requirement became effective in 2006, and many food manufacturers have reformulated products to reduce or eliminate trans fat. At the time of publication of the final rule in 2003, FDA estimated that Americans were consuming 4.6 grams per person per day of industrially produced trans fat on average, while intake from naturally occurring sources was estimated at 1.2 grams per person per day. Now I have a quiz, pack, a quiz question for you to go ahead and answer. Where would you look on a food product to determine if a product contains a partially hydrogenated oil? I'll answer that in a, in a minute. So the food labeling regulations are found in 21 CFR 
and describe how trans fat must be declared on the nutrition label. Trans fat must be declared to the nearest half a gram per serving if the content is below 5 grams and to the nearest gram if the content is above 5 grams. Trans fat may be declared as zero if a serving contains less than 0 0.5 grams. Foods sold at deli and bakery service cases are exempt from labeling unless the food bears a claim or other nutrition information. The threshold for a zero declaration was based on the limit of detection of the methods used to analyze foods for trans fat. Products listing zero on the label but containing a partially hydrogenated oil in the ingredient list still contain some amount of trans fat but below 0 0.5 grams. Now, other, act oh, sorry. other activities related to the use of PHOs are being handled in the Office of Food Additive Safety and include two citizen petitions on file and under review. These are from the Center for Science and the Public Interest received in 2004 and from Dr. Fred Kumro, a professor at the University of Illinois, received in 2009. Both petitions request that FDA prohibit the use of partially hydrogenated oils due to health concerns. FDA has also identified reducing trans fat consumption as a priority in the Foods and Veterinary Medicine Strategic Plan, and it is a part of the Department of Health and Human Services Million Hearts Initiative. Since further trans fat reductions were identified as an FDA priority, our office looked at trans fat intake in 2010 and again in 2012 to assess current consumption patterns. These analyses were designed to determine the impact of trans fat labeling, help in our review of the citizen petitions, develop strategies for further trans fat reduction, and to assess the current state of the market. Our analyses showed that individuals can still consume relatively high levels of trans fat from PHOs if they frequently consume certain brands or types of food products. Our study also showed that microwave popcorn and frozen pizzas were the biggest contributors to intake. We have seen a continued reduction in intake of trans fats from PHO, PHOs from 2010 to 2012, and we believe this is continuing. There are a number of factors driving the reformulations, such as restrictions by some states and municipalities on the use of trans fat containing ingredients in food service facilities, Walmart's initiative to eliminate all remaining artificial trans fat in the products it sells by 2015, and industry also continues with reformulation efforts in response to consumer demand for healthier products. And finally, FDA has recommended that consumers can lower their intake by looking at the trans fat content on the Nutrition Facts panel, as well as avoiding products listing PHOs on the ingredient statement. And that is the quiz answer. You would look at the ingredients list for partially hydrogenated oils if you'd like to avoid products containing them. And it looks like the majority of you did get that correct, that you would look in the ingredient statement. Now, as the agency's next step towards further reduction of trans fat in the food supply, FDA published a notice on November 8, 2013, with its tentative determination that PHOs are not grass based on the health risks associated with consumption of trans fats from these oils. If you click on the Federal Register citation in this slide, you can read the entire document. FDA's regulation in 21 CFR 170.38 provides that FDA, on its own initiative, may publish a notice determining that the su a substance is not grass and is a food additive subject to the provisions of Section 409 of the Act. As discussed in the notice linked on this slide, CDC estimated in 2012 that eliminating the remaining uses of PHOs from the food supply could, could prevent 10 to 20,000 coronary events and 3 to 7,000 deaths from coronary heart disease each year. FDA's tentative determination was based on the review of the science and on findings from expert panels such as IOM. During our review, we noted that while intake has decreased as a result of voluntary reformulations, there are many processed foods still formulated with PHOs, and some contain high levels. Now, this determination applies to the use of PHOs as an ingredient in processed food, regardless of whether it's sold in a grocery store, bakery, or restaurant. And I've also provided a link to FDA's consumer update with more information on our website on trans fat. 
Regarding FDA's authority to make this tentative determination, one of our, F our, one of our core regulatory functions is to ensure a safe food supply, which includes ensuring the safety of ingredients added to food. If a substance added to food is not safe, we are obligated to take action. As I mentioned previously, even though grass substances do not require pre-market approval by FDA under the Act, there must be general recognition of their safety. If the grass status of PHOs cannot be demonstrated, interested parties can petition FDA to establish safe conditions of use as a food additive. FDA requested comments as well as scientific data and information on its tentative determination during a 120-day comment period that ended on March 8th of this year. We requested comments in seven general areas, including whether we should finalize the determination, data to support alternative approaches, how long it would take to eliminate PHOs from the food supply, considerations for small business, reformulation challenges, and whether there were any prior sanctions for PHOs. We received over 1,500 comments on the notice, as well as about 5,000 form letters. The majority of the comments were from individuals, but we also received many substantive comments from trade associations, food and oil manufacturers, consumer advocacy groups, health professional organizations, and state and local governments. We also requested comments on the estimated costs and benefits associated with the removal of PHOs from the food supply. FDA's analysis focused on processed foods and foods prepared at home. In this slide, I summarize some of the figures from our cost-benefit calculations, and the full memo can be found in the docket online for the Federal Register notice. We also recognize that there may be other costs that specifically pertain to small businesses, and we asked for and received comments on this topic. So currently, the comments are under review by FDA, and we are conducting a fair evaluation of all submissions. And so we will then be determining our next steps after reviewing all of the comments. And if you would like more information on TransFat, I've included a link to our website that um, will take you there. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to try to address them if we have time. Thank you so much, Michael, for that wonderful overview of uh, partially hydrogenated oils and trans fat. You did get some questions during the, there may be questions coming in right now, but there, there were questions. The first questions are, uh, that someone wants you to answer is, are all trans fats unhealthy? For example, trans fats from ruminants uh, through their milk and through beef or cheese, are those also unhealthy? Well, there, I, my understanding is there is some literature out there on trans fats from ruminant sources and trying to understand if there are different health effects from the artificial versus the ruminant trans fats. And I, my understanding is that area does require some further research. I don't think there's been anything definitive on um, whether industrially produced trans fat is really worse. And I also note that you know the IOM made the recommendation that people limit trans fat consumption but still maintain a nutritionally adequate diet, which would include some of those foods that contain naturally occurring trans fats. So um, their recommendation is really to try to avoid industrially produced trans fat as much as possible. And then um, another participant had uh, some input to the webinar. Remember, as the audience, you can give input in many different ways. And this participant said, the question that you put up on the screen, question 11, had two possible answers. And uh, it is possible to read the yes. label and but not look for trans fat. So would you like to comment? Yeah, actually, I was interested in seeing if people were avoiding PHO specifically, uh, which is why I worded the question like that. I realized that people pro probably were looking for trans fat content as well, and maybe not necessarily avoiding products that contain declared amounts of trans fat. But I was curious if if people were avoiding specifically partially hydrogenated oils. And there's another question that it's actually a comment and it's uh, sort of something to um, expound upon if you like. Uh, 
toxicological safety versus nutritional endpoints. And we know we had a question like that this morning on, you know, how do we do toxicological safety? So the questioner wants to know, where do you draw the line between when there's something that's, you know, toxicologically safe according to the Red Book instructions, or that there's some nutritional value for it or nutritional endpoint? Well, that's actually one of the comments. We received comments along those lines that we're currently reviewing, so we'll probably have a, a more um, detailed response to that um, in the response, uh, our final determination, uh, whichever way that comes out. But just to make a note, as far as safety of food ingredients, um, you know, we look at you know a variety of safety endpoints and adverse events, you know, adverse effects. So, um, you know, we certainly would do consider adverse effects on LDL as an adverse effect of um, trans fat consumption or from PHO consumption. So. It is part of the overall safety assessment. Now, here's a question that really stumps me, but you probably have an answer to it. Um, how does FDA define zero? I mean, is there something different out there that we're not aware of? How does FDA define zero? Well, for labeling purposes, it's below 0.5. But yes. That's... I think that's what right. we meant. Yes. yes, I think that's what we meant. All right. Well, again, I want to thank you for the uh, most interesting presentation and thank the people in the audience for sending in their questions. So uh, at this point, we're going to transition to the next presentation.